The project that we're working on today, or be looking at, is on the sharp section, the SPS-4 test road in Kansas. Serial number for this particular section is 20A4. Uh, we uh, had two existing test sections located here, and uh, are now looking at some surface deterioration that's taken place, and we'll go through the process of the rehabilitation of this surface. Uh, this particular pavement, when it was constructed in 1985, was, uh, had dowel baskets for joints every 30 feet. Uh, the shoulders and main line were all poured simultaneously, so we had 40 feet of pavement, 24-foot uh, lanes plus a 6-foot and 10-foot shoulder, all poured simultaneously. Uh, the 30-foot originally planned joints do not appear to be moving correctly. Uh, it's quite possible that they're frozen up. And so each of the 30-foot panels has cracked fairly close to the middle, making 15-foot panels out of it. Uh, these mid-panel cracks also tend to line up with the 15-foot uh, spacing joints that were sawed on both the inside and outside shoulder. Uh, you can see here some of the spalling and deterioration that's taken place at one of the uh, joints. Uh, when I get the screen back on it, uh, you can see that there is some vertical motion taking place. Now this is at one of the joints that has formed uh, in the mid panel. And so we'll go through today the process of inserting dowel bars to uh, eliminate the vertical motion in these joints, allow horizontal motion, and uh, hopefully rehabilitate the surface so that it uh, becomes smoother. Here's the serial number of uh, one of the sharp test sections. You can see as we slowly drive down the road here, there is uh, evidence of vertical faulting as shown by the shadow cast by the low sun angle this morning at the mid-panel cracks. We reestablished or established two new test sections to go in conjunction with the SPS section here, one of which uh, we had the dowel insertion and um, diamond ground the surface, but stopped at that point. We did not resaw the uh, transverse cracks and attempt to seal them. The other test section, uh, we did go ahead and resaw the transverse crack and attempt to seal it. And you'll see all of that as we go through the process of the dowel bar slot cutting and insertion. Here we see the sawing equipment that is the first step of uh, creating the slots for the dowel bar insertion. Uh, this particular piece of equipment has uh, two sawing mandrels on it and each mandrel has six saw blades spaced uh, in pairs, uh, giving a slot about two inches wide and uh, one foot spacing between each pair of saw blades, which gives us uh, parallel slots. The red mark you see on the pavement simply marks the location of the transverse crack that they are attempting to saw on. The two sawing heads are individually controllable so that they do not have to be directly across from each other in case there is some meandering to the transverse crack, which usually is the case. The depth finder that you see on the dolly wheel that we keep zooming in close to shows how deep the saw is going into the pavement. Uh, and they saw these slots in three passes generally. The first pass is to a depth of two inches then they'll lower the blades two more inches into the pavement and saw back the other direction. And once they reach the starting point, then they drop the blade the final inch to inch and a half, making a total of about five and a half inch depth. And they make the final cut going in the forward direction again. So in three passes, then they have sawed uh, all of the slots. They will attempt to zoom in close and see the blades. It's kind of hard to see up underneath the machine there. But you'll notice that there are some pairs of diamond cutting blades uh, with about a two inch space between them. And in just a second, we'll pull the machine away and you'll be able to see the resulting slots on the pavement. Here's the resulting slots for one wheel path. There are three slots in each wheel path, uh, approximately two inches wide, uh, 24 to 30 inches long on the surface. And the transverse crack hopefully is fairly close to the middle of each of those slots. And again, you'll see the red mark on the pavement, which helps the equipment operator locate the crack when he's sawing the slots.
The next step is to chisel out the material in each slot and here we use lightweight chipping hammers uh, to chisel the material trying to make the pieces as large as possible and do minimal damage to the uh, concrete on either side of the slot. They are now doing just light chiseling to clean the rubble out of the bottom of the slot and then using compressed air to blow the loose pieces out of the slot. The uh, rubble is then loaded into a front end loader simply to get it off of the lane, uh, scooping it up by a shovel and loading it into a dump truck to haul away. The next step is to clean the slot thoroughly prior to putting the dowel in place and putting the grout in, using sandblasting here to clean the side walls of the slot as well as the bottom and to blow the debris away from the surface. You see the cleaned out slots uh, with the sides having been sandblasted to uh, remove any loose uh, deposits from the sawing and slot cutting action uh, so that we have a nice clean, dry, firm surface for the grout cement which will be put in with the dowel to adhere to. Uh, we look closely at the side wall of the slot and you can see the vertical crack which is the uh, transverse crack formed by nature that has run down through the slot. This is looking down in the slot at the bottom. It's chipped out fairly smooth. Uh, did not have to worry too much about this because the dowels do sit on uh, chairs which holds them up off the bottom about a half inch. You can see by the ruler here that the slots have cut about five and a half to five and three quarters of an inch deep. Here we happen to be cutting right beside the reinforcing steel that's in this pavement. It's a six by six mesh. And you'll notice as we zoom in on it that the wire in the reinforcing steel is actually broken at the point where the vertical crack goes down through the pavement, indicating that there was enough stress at the, this location, and this is probably characteristic throughout the site, um, that it actually severed the steel. Uh, thus, you've lost the load transfer and motion inhibitance. And that's why we're installing the dowels to try and re-establish that load transfer. Here you can see one where the steel was actually cut by the saw blade and was snagged and it pulled out a little bit. Once the hole has been prepared in this manner, then we are ready to lay out the dowels and install them, get ready to put the grout in place to hold them in. Here you see uh, the three dowels sitting in place. The uh, uh, light green color is the epoxy coating on the dowels. They're inch and a half diameter and 18 inches long. The red sleeve that you see on one end of each dowel is a plastic tubing that is used as the bond breaker. The plastic tubing would become adhered in the concrete and uh, the dowel would uh, allow motion inside that plastic tubing, thus uh, allowing for the expansion and contraction of the concrete pavement. You can see the chairs that each of these dowel bars is sitting on, which holds them up off the bottom of the slot approximately a half inch and also keeps them centered in the slot that's been cut. It's a two inch slot. We're putting in an inch and a half dowel bar. You set the dowel bar down in the slot, and in positioning the dowel bar, you would want the, uh, the sleeve pushed up onto the dowel bar and have the joint uh, between the red and the green approximately at the location of the transverse crack.
The next step in the insertion process is to uh, deposit the concrete slurry uh, in the slots. And we use a mixer that just drives along, dumps a deposited amount uh, spread around by shovels to make sure that you've got uh, enough to fill all the slots. Uh, any large chunks are removed. Then they come along with a, a vibrator, as you'll see here in just a second when he stops at the next hole. He uses an electric vibrator to uh, briefly consolidate the material to make sure that it is thoroughly uh, settled down in the hole around the rebar uh, and also uh, that the hole is, is uh, uniformly filled and that the air has been pumped out of it. Uh, residue is then scooped off of the shovel. Uh, squeegee is used to finish the process of smoothing off the surface of each of the dowels. Uh, not a whole lot of time was spent doing this because uh, diamond grinding was going to follow behind this, so the uh, surface did not have to be uh, finished very smoothly. Once the uh, consolidation and, and smoothing off had been completed, a light spray of curing compound was sprayed on each of the three slots to uh, help uh, slow down the evaporation of water from the concrete grout. The next step was to diamond grind the entire surface. Uh, it was elected to diamond grind the entire length and width of each lane as opposed to trying to spot grind uh, at the locations where the repairs had been made. Here you can see the uh, slots that have been filled uh, prior to grinding and in the uh, outside wheel path uh, you can see where the grinding has taken place and the slots have more or less disappeared. Uh, the grinding was done in three passes, four feet in each pass, uh, three passes thus making a full 12 foot lane. And uh, as I said, the entire length and width of the driving lane was lightly ground just enough to take out the irregularities of the vertical faulting that had taken place at the joints. The uh, slurry residue, water and grinding material that uh, uh, the machines generated was simply pumped over to the side of the road and dumped on the shoulder. The texture that's left by the grinding operation, as you can see, is longitudinal grooving, so to speak. The uh, series of diamond blades used in the grinding are approximately eighth of an inch wide each with approximately eighth of an inch spacer between each blade. And on this close-up, you can see the uh, longitudinal grooving that was left by the diamond grinding operation. The diamond grinding had been completed and the highway opened back up to traffic again. You can see the slight uh, change in color that has shown up here indicating that the slots uh, are there. The surface is smooth but the color is a little bit different. As we zoom in close you can see that the transverse crack has reoccurred through the, um, the epoxy, well, not epoxy, but the concrete grout material that was put in with the rebar. So the transverse crack did reappear immediately. step in the process was to saw out the existing sealant material in the uh, original transverse joints and longitudinal joints. To do that, a uh, blade set up as you see here with two blades with a spacer between them, giving a total cut width of approximately one half inch, was used on these uh, highly mobile uh, sawing units. And in just a few seconds when they get things lined up here, we'll actually see them going along sawing out the sealant material which uh, was still in the original longitudinal and transverse cracks. Now you can see the residual crack here that they generated was approximately a half inch in width. Now you can see one of the saws in operation uh, it moves fairly quickly in this stage of it because they are simply removing the backer rod and um, sealant material that's in the slot. They're not actually having to recut the slot itself because these are existing slots already. So it, uh, it moves along fairly quickly at this stage. In addition to re-sawing uh, the transverse and longitudinal joints, of course, uh, there's a step included also of attempting to saw out a reservoir for the sealant material in the 
transverse cracks at the mid-panel transverse crack, which has had the dowel bar inserted across it. Uh, they use a much smaller blade here because of the irregularity of the crack. It's not just a straight saw cut. So it's uh, much more time consuming uh, to me try to follow the meandering crack across the mid panel. Uh, the blade here is about six to eight inches in diameter. Uh, again, a pair of blades, but you can see here the irregular path that uh, is followed. And it's going to be much more difficult to seal this particular crack because of the irregular edges of the crack itself. Now you can see there where they've sawed right across the uh, dowel insertion slots uh, and had some, some pretty crooked crack to try and follow. Uh, makes a pretty rough cut, but it has cut a slot about a half inch deep. Uh, you can see there are places where the uh, crack was missed. Uh, hopefully when they use the air, they blew the uh, small pieces out between the saw cut and the crack itself. Uh, this is a very difficult part of the process is following this meandering crack uh, in the transverse crack created by nature. Now here you see a location where they realized they'd missed the crack and they had to go back and saw it again. Leaves kind of an, of an island of concrete. Uh, they'll have to seal around both sides of that. Now this location, you can see where they saw it along beside the crack, but we're not actually right on top of the crack. So you end up with a little sliver of concrete between the saw blade cut and the natural crack. Uh, this again, uh, hopefully will be blown out uh, by the uh, compressed air when they come through to clean these joints out prior to putting the sealant in place. Once the cracks have been sawed, then we use compressed air and sand again to sandblast the joints of the cracks to clear out the residue left by the sawing operation prior to placing the sealant. Now this particular machine is set up on a dolly such that they can, uh, on the original transverse cracks, uh, can just move right along and see it blows it out fairly quickly. Uh, following the meandering cracks was a little more difficult. Uh, to blow out the material in the meandered cracks. Now you can see a piece of the sealant material that popped up or the uh, backer rod. Once this machine has uh, blown the bulk of it out, uh, there's another man coming along behind this machine with a hand wand to finish the job of cleaning out each crack. Now you can see him using the hand wand to clean the surface off, but also to uh, finish cleaning out uh, any residue that might have been left in the transverse crack. That's a piece of back of rod or an old piece of sealant that was still left stuck to the crack. The next step was to install the back of rod Remember this slot is approximately half inches wide and uh, inch to inch and a half deep. So this backing rod, which is a foam material, is uh, installed in the slot to provide a uniform bottom to the hole. And thus when you put the sealant material in, you get a uniform cross section. The roller being used here to mash the backer rod down into the crack uh, is simply uh, a large wheel in the center, approximately half inch wide, two small wheels on the outside, uh, to ride on the surface of the concrete. And uh, so here he's just mashing the uh, foam backing rod down into the slot. Once the backer rod has been placed, then the final step is to place the sealant in the crack, um, attempting to seal up the joints. Uh, it's fairly rapidly moving, uh, however, you've got to try and keep the nozzle in the crack. You see occasionally it uh, jumps out, but the uh, idea is to put enough sealant in the crack to fill the crack, making good contact with both sides of the crack, 
but you do not want it piled up in residue. So the final product, as you see here, is a seal joint. Uh, it's a self-leveling type sealant, so it does tend to flow downhill toward the edge of the shoulder and create a puddle there at the edge of the shoulder. Now you can see a little bit of sand laying on top of it, but it's uh, recessed below the surface so the tires do not actually make contact with it as they drive down the road. That's the goal. If you put too much sealant in, then it spills out on the surface, as you see here. And you'll also notice if there's a, a non-sealed, where the backer rod did not seal against the sidewalls of either the crack or the joint, uh, you end up with a hole pocket in the sealant. Now, they did come back and spot check this uh, with a bucket of sealant and try and fill those crevices back up in the spots where uh, there was noticeable lack of sealant, such as right here.